On the 7th of October 1944, US Admiral Chester Nimitz, the commander of American forces in the Pacific, issued orders directing the units under his command to prepare for an operation to seize the Japanese-held island known as Iwo Jima. Located just over 1,000 kilometers off the coast of Japan, Iwo Jima was considered to be one of the most important objectives of the war in the Pacific, as its capture would not only open the way for future US invasions of Okinawa and Japan itself, but it would also, in the words of the US Marine Corps' official history, allow the Americans to maintain unremitting military pressure against Japan and extend control over the Western Pacific. In American hands, Iwo Jima could be turned into a base from which we could attack the Japanese home islands, protect our bases in the Marianas, cover our naval forces, and provide fighter escort for very long-range bomber operations. To the Japanese, Iwo Jima was equally important, as it was the only island in the region that could sustain air operations, which were essential for raiding American bases on Guam and the Mariana Islands, and for intercepting US bombers heading for Japan. In addition, Iwo Jima was one of several islands in the Northwest Pacific that served as the last line of defense before the Japanese mainland, and thus Japanese commanders were fully aware that if the island fell, it would open the way for a US invasion of their homeland. It was for these reasons that Iwo Jima was turned into a fortress, and by the fall of 1944, the Japanese had built over 800 pillboxes, dug over 16 kilometers of tunnels and underground facilities, and deployed up to 20,000 men to defend the island. To put this all into perspective, Iwo Jima is only 8 kilometers long and 6 kilometers wide, and it became the most heavily fortified island in the Pacific. Knowing this fact, Admiral Chester Nimitz and his staff quickly came to the conclusion that a significant preliminary bombardment would have to be conducted before any ground invasion could take place. Accordingly, from the 8th of December 1944, the US Air Force commenced a large-scale bombing campaign to soften up the enemy defenses. And over the next two and a half months, hundreds of American B-24, B-25 and B-29 bombers would visit the island every day and drop thousands of tons of explosives and napalm onto the enemy forces below. Unknown to the Americans, however, this bombardment failed to have the desired effect, as most of the Japanese fortifications, especially those underground, were largely untouched by the bombing and remained intact. Nevertheless, as the Air Force pounded away at the island, preparations for a ground invasion continued apace, and it was in the middle of February 1945 that Admiral Nimitz, satisfied that everything was in place and ready to go, gave the authorization for the assault on Iwo Jima to begin, with D-Day set for the 19th of February. From ports across the Pacific, a vast naval armada of some 495 vessels converged on the small Japanese island, with the first warships arriving offshore on the 16th of February, and immediately joining the Air Force in bombarding the enemy entrenchments. Three days later, in the early hours of the 19th, the remainder of the Armada appeared on the horizon, including 168 transport ships carrying over 70,000 US Marines of the 3rd, 4th and 5th Marine Divisions. At 0800 that morning, under the cover of naval fire, the men of the 4th and 5th Divisions were lowered into the ocean on board their landing craft and landing vehicle tracked, and it was at 0830 that they set off from their assembly area to assault the eastern beaches of Iwo Jima. The US Marine Corps' official history explains that. The Marines watched the island take a severe pounding from the naval shelling, and cheered as the supporting aircraft unloaded their lethal cargo over the island. The men approaching Iwo Jima were fully aware of what lay ahead. There had been no attempt at concealing the fact that a tough and costly battle awaited them. Their mood varied from incredulity that any of the defenders could survive the heavy naval bombardment to skepticism born out of past experience. Many Marines remembered how many of the Japanese had survived similar bombardments on Terawa, Guam and Peleliu. Shortly before 0900, the first wave of US Marines touched down on Iwo Jima, with the 4th Marine Division landing on the right, whilst the 5th was on the left. In both divisional sectors, enemy opposition to the first wave was non-existent, with the loose sand on the beaches initially presenting the biggest difficulties. However, it was as the forward marines began moving inland at around 0930 that suddenly a ferocious war of small arms and machine gun fire began to be received, 
as the Japanese forces appeared from their dugouts and effectively ambushed the American troops from three sides. At around the same time, Japanese mortar and artillery fire laid down a devastating barrage onto the beaches, most of which by then were becoming crowded as the follow-up battalions started to come ashore. Among these battalions was the 2nd Battalion, the 28th Marine Regiment, which commenced disembarking in 5th Division Sector at 0935. Through all the chaos and enemy fire that reigned over the landing areas at that time, the battalion was quick to organise itself and begin moving inland just after 1000, where it took up a defensive position covering the divisional left flank. Here the battalion would remain until the afternoon of D-Day, when orders came through instructing it to mount a westward attack in the direction of Mount Suribachi. Accordingly, the Marines of 2nd Battalion moved out from their positions just after 1645, and in the face of withering enemy fire, they advanced steadily forward to their objective, methodically clearing Japanese fortifications as they went, but sustaining heavy casualties in the process. Involved in this advance was 21-year-old Private First Class Donald Roll, who, together with his platoon, closed up to and engaged an enemy blockhouse manned by eight Japanese soldiers. As a result of the platoon's fire, the Japanese occupants were suppressed and forced to retire to a new defensive position. As soon as he saw that the enemy was starting to withdraw, Private Roll immediately left his platoon's position, rushed forward alone to the entrance of the blockhouse, and without hesitation he began engaging the eight enemy troops at close range. Within a minute, he had killed one of the Japanese soldiers with his rifle and bayoneted another, after which the remaining six enemy soldiers ran off and disappeared into the fog of war. Private Donald Roll then returned to his platoon, where new orders were received at 1730, directing the 2nd Battalion to stop its attack on Mount Suribachi, and return to its previously held positions. By evening of D-Day on the 19th of February 1945, the battalion had successfully withdrawn, and was digging in for the night on the extreme left flank of the 5th Division. Almost immediately though, the battalion found itself in action once more, as the Japanese used the cover of darkness to infiltrate and harass the American front line and over the course of the night of the 19th to the 20th of February, the entire divisional sector was engaged in holding off numerous enemy attacks. The history of the 5th Marine Division records that, after the heavy fighting during the day, the hours of darkness were needed for rest and reorganisation. The enemy had other plans. The night of D-Day was active for numerous infiltration attempts, an attempted counter-attack in strength, and heavy shelling of our lines and rear areas. By morning on the 20th of February, all Japanese attempts to dislodge the 5th Marine Division had been repulsed and the American line was stabilised. With this, plans were put in motion for the resumption of offensive operations, and it was at 0830 that the 2nd Battalion, the 28th Marine Regiment, set out from its defensive positions and launched another attack towards Mount Suribachi. However, despite receiving significant artillery, naval and air support, the battalion advance was slow due to the depth and scale of the Japanese fortifications, with each strong point having to be methodically cleared by the marines, or destroyed with flamethrowers and demolition charges. Further compounding the advance was the increasing number of casualties being sustained within the battalion, and it was not long after the attack had got underway that Private First Class Donald Roll spotted a wounded marine lying out in the open in full view of the enemy. Seeing that the Marine was still alive, Private Roll, for the second time in less than 24 hours, disregarded his own safety and ran out into no man's land to rescue the Marine. An article published by the US Marine Corps University continues, He left the safety of his position and moved out under a tremendous volume of mortar and machine gun fire to rescue a wounded Marine lying in an exposed position about 40 yards forward of the front lines. Half carrying and half pulling the wounded man, Private First Class Roll removed him to a position out of reach of enemy rifles. Calling for an assistant and a stretcher, he again braved the heavy fire to carry the casualty 300 yards back to an aid station on the beach. Through the courageous actions of Private Roll, the wounded Marine was successfully carried out to no man's land and withdrawn to an aid post to be treated for his wounds. Remarkably, despite being exposed to a large volume of enemy fire, Private Roll didn't sustain a single wound throughout the action, and so, after dropping off his colleague at the aid station, he made his way back to the front line to rejoin his platoon, where he continued to take the initiative and inspire those around him for the remainder of the day. In one such instance, he volunteered to take point and conduct a reconnaissance of a Japanese gun emplacement that was sighted on the right flank of the platoon's advance. Cautiously moving forward alone, Private Donald Roll approached the emplacement, but to his surprise, found that it was completely abandoned, 
and so he signalled for the rest of his platoon to move up and establish itself on the position. Shortly thereafter, at 1700 on the 20th of February, the 2nd Battalion brought its advance to a halt so that it could consolidate its gains and recuperate following a day of heavy fighting. They had seen it advance only 200 metres in 9 hours, but make an appreciable dent in the enemy defences. The next morning, at 0825 on the 21st of February, the battalion resumed its offensive against Mount Suribachi, and it was at some point during this attack that Private First Class Donald Roll demonstrated a supreme act of gallantry that would ultimately see him awarded the Medal of Honor. His medal citation states, Pushing forward in the assault against the vast network of fortifications surrounding Mount Suribachi, he crawled with his platoon guide, Sergeant Henry Hansen, to the top of a Japanese bunker to bring fire to bear on enemy troops located on the far side of the bunker. Suddenly, a hostile grenade landed between the two Marines. Instantly, Private First Class Roll called a warning to his fellow Marine and dived on the deadly missile, absorbing the full impact of the shattering explosion in his own body and protecting all within range from the danger of flying fragments. As a result of the heroic actions of Private Roll, Sergeant Henry Hansen survived the grenade blast without incurring any injuries from the shell fragments. Sadly though, Private First Class Donald Roll was killed instantly from the explosion, and although he had the option of rolling away and jumping down from the bunker rooftop to save himself, he instead made the split-second decision to lay down his life to save that of Sergeant Hansen. His citation continues. An indomitable fighter, Private First Class Roll rendered heroic service toward the defeat of a ruthless enemy, and his valour, initiative and unfaltering spirit of self-sacrifice in the face of almost certain death sustain and enhance the highest traditions of the US Naval Service. He gallantly gave his life for his country. Thank you for watching this video, if you enjoyed it please be sure to leave a like and subscribe so that you never miss one of my future videos.